and we're live. Hey guys, welcome back to another cracking installment of the Matt Brown Show. Today I'm joined by a lady who's got quite a compelling story. Uh, if you have been living in this country, at least you would have probably come across this. It's been heavily featured in the media over the last few years. Her name is Kim McCasker. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Just look up. <laughs> See, we're short of staff today. <laughs> Rent a crowd, went AWOL, I wasn't paying them enough. <laughs> okay, Kim, so um, so thanks for being here. Um, we have the same publisher, that's how we kind of got introduced to each other. Mm-hmm. Um, your book, Scarred But Not For Life, is kind of where we'll start and then we'll see where we go. Um, but uh, set this up for us. What's the? Where does the story begin? So it begins back in 2011, Um on a morning where I was following my normal routine and the events that happened that day were events that changed my life and many others' lives forever. Um, Should I go into the whole... Yeah, what happened? I mean, you got us on Tita Hooks now, eh? Sorry. (laughs) Okay. There so. was this amazing thing. It changed <laughs> lives forever. <laughs> what, okay. Uh, what, what was that yeah. thing? <laughs> That's usually where the conversation would go. But okay. A nice, nice cliffhanger. Um, we should use that as the, like, pr- the pre-roll, you know what I mean? And then, and then wait for the punchline, which comes like this. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. So it was a Tuesday morning in September in 2011. Um, like I said, I was doing my normal thing, which was making my way to... Uh, the gym in Lone Hill. Uh, I was a passenger in a vehicle which my fiancé at the time was driving. And we came to a big intersection which was a four-way stop. We were in a queue of traffic waiting our turn to cross the intersection. And what a lot of the taxis did was drive in the right-hand turning only lane and then try and squeeze their way into the lane crossing the intersection. So once we were at the stop street to cross the intersection, a taxi did that and ended up hitting the back of our vehicle, which resulted in a minor dent. It was nothing major. It, I mean, it was a small bumper bashing. The taxi stopped where he had driven into us, and my fiancé drove as much as he could to the side of the road. It didn't have a pavement, but to get out of the way of all the cars on the on the road. Like I said, it was, well, I don't know if I said, but it was at quarter past six in the morning. So the roads were very, very busy. Um, what happened next was my fiancé got out of the vehicle to approach the driver of the taxi and to get all the necessary details for an accident report or an insurance claim or whatever. Um, you know, your normal response to an accident is to exchange details. Mm. Uh, I stayed in the car initially and I watched this interaction going on and the taxi driver wouldn't open his window. He was looking straight ahead and wouldn't look out of his um, driver's window where my fiancé was standing. And eventually I started seeing gesticulating and hand gesturing and it seemed like things weren't progressing at all. And there was possibly a little bit of frustration coming into the the mix. So I made the decision to get out of the car, make my way to this taxi and try and engage with him, thinking I as a female would possibly get a better result. So like I said, the roads were very busy. I made my way carefully towards him, looking for cars left and right um, and focusing on his taxi. He looked straight out his windscreen still while Lawrence was at his driver's window. And when I was just about to reach his driver's side and still in front of the taxi, he accelerated. He knocked me almost to the ground and I tried to get up and right myself, screaming at the same time, no, 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 you can't go, I'm, I'm standing here. He looked at me through his windscreen and he accelerated and drove off, off up the road until he was forced to stop. How far down the road was that? 780 meters. So just to be clear, so basically you were in front of this car, he obviously didn't give a shit about that and decided to drive over you and you were caught underneath the car and dragged that distance, is that? That's correct, John. Okay. And then what happened? Um, 
I must just say, when when you say, you know, I was caught under it and dragged, um, this was an intentional thing. It was deliberate and malicious and, without a doubt, intentional. Um, Unfortunately, after that intersection, the direction in which we and the taxi were traveling opened up and there was no traffic like there was at the intersection. So he had free reign to drive with no, yeah, yeah. with no obstructions. Um, but almost from the beginning, other cars, sitting bumper to bumper, started hooting and screaming and turning around and following him, trying to alert his attention to a problem that, you know, they at the time maybe thought he wasn't aware of. He responded to none of them. Mm. So whether he meant to drag me under the taxi or I got caught and he knowingly drove on with me, um, I can't say, but he only stopped when a human roadblock was formed and he had to pull off to the side. Sure, so they, they did stop him in the end? Yes. Okay, Yeah. and where were you at this point? So when the taxi stopped, I was still under it. Um, it had hit me... The, his driver's side wheel had hit me um, and I'd been stuck underneath the front of the taxi. By the time it had stopped, the back driver's wheel was resting on my pelvis. So I'm told. So I obviously moved that bit of distance under the vehicle. Um, opposite where the taxi was stopped, thank God, there was a fire station. So paramedics were on the scene instantly mm. and the taxi was lifted off me. Uh, I was then attended to by paramedics and my head was immobilized and everything started happening around me. My fiancé had somehow made his way to the the bus stop where the taxi was forced into and then the process of calling an ambulance and telling me, reassuring me, telling me what was going on, communicating, etc., etc., happened. And were you conscious this entire time? So I don't remember the taxi being lifted off me. I remember everything else. I remember the beginning. I remember shouting. I remember hearing cars hooting. Um, the passengers in the taxi were screaming. I remember all of that. I remember my thoughts while this was going on. But at some point, I must have lost consciousness because mm. I can't remember the stopping and the taxi being lifted off me. I can remember after that again, though. And what were you thinking at the time? I didn't realize the severity of what had happened. Um, I said, okay, well, I can't see. My glasses have fallen off. I said to my fiancé, there's another pair at home. Please just go and fetch them and bring them to me. And, <laughs> you know, his attitude was, she's going to die here on the road. So he was going You're nowhere. You're going to need your sunnies, chick. <laughs> yeah. So he was going nowhere. Um, I said to him a few times, Ugh, you know, just just pick me up okay I know there's something wrong just pick me up and we'll go home we'll sort it out there a um, couple of band-aids you yeah, know yeah can't so, be that bad so I was I kept asking the paramedic just to let me turn my head and see what all the commotion was about um, you know they were worried about spinal fractures and paralysis so they keep your head still um, but yeah I really didn't realize the severity for quite a long time um, The paramedics were talking to me as they were doing whatever it was they were doing. And only, I, I can't say how long we waited for an ambulance for. It felt like a long time. Um, but I had paramedics working on me right from the start. Uh, and over that period, I eventually started to think to myself, okay, this is, this is, this is more, more serious, serious than, than what think. I thought. Yeah. I could tell by Lawrence's reactions and by the things he was saying to me and the panic state he was in that... I was in trouble. Yeah. Yeah. And how old were you at this time? I was 25. Okay. Um, and also, I suppose, one of the other things you probably weren't aware of until much later was that um, someone who saw this actually go down called into John Robbie's show on Radio 72, and that's where it caught the public attention. Yes, that is what I was told. Um, I obviously never heard that call taking place but well you were um, underneath the taxi so go. it's okay you know i'm forgiven the one, the <laughs> just one don't thing do I that do again that. right you always <laughs> want to be on that show especially um, when you're the, the the subject matter you know what i mean <laughs> so yeah that is apparently what happened and um they were sort of giving a play-by-play -play 
uh, account of what they were seeing. And that's where the story, I think, grew legs and turned into something that the public followed closely. Okay. So you, the ambulance arrived and then took you to, to hospital, right? Yeah, they took me to the Four Ways Life Hospital, which was the closest hospital to the scene of the accident. And what did they, I mean, how extensive were your injuries at that point? Oh, no, they were terrible. They were, they were very, very severe. I mean, my family was told to say goodbye. Only my immediate family was allowed, in, allowed into the emergency theatre um, for that reason, uh, in case, you know. And, yeah, the extent of the injuries were horrific. I had seven fracture, fractured vertebra. I had both my hips fractured. I had my right knee fractured and all the ligaments and tendons torn off that knee. Um, I had a left little finger fractured. My right ear was almost detached. It was hanging on by a little bit of a thread. Um, and then the, the real ugly injuries and... I mean, they were all serious, but the but the polytrauma, which is the soft tissue damage that had taken place, was devastating. So I'd been dragged along my back on the tar, and over that distance that I was dragged, I had lost 58% of my body tissue and muscle and mass and whatever else was left on the road. Um, and those were the injuries that that were you know, difficult to, were going to be difficult to treat. Holy shit. Yeah. Um, so were you, were you, I suppose you would have to be told that this is what's happened to you, right? I was right? never, or, no. Um, so they actually didn't say anything? No, and apparently my family was advised not to give me the true reality of the situation I was in. Huh. And I think that was done because they didn't want my mindset to become oh my God, look at this insurmountable task in front of me, I'm mm. giving up. Mm. So uh, I was, no, I was not told for a very long time. Mm. And uh, could you walk or move? I'm not, no. not walk, but I mean, could you move your feet and that no. kind of thing? So I was immobilized in ICU in isolation. So a little glass box. Yeah. Um, the risk of infection with open injuries like that, down to bone, down to muscle, the risk is very, very high. So hence the isolation. And I spent three months in this isolation unit. Um, I think about two days before being discharged was the first time I stood up in that period. And I was bandaged almost from head to toe. I looked like a mummy. I, had, I wasn't allowed to elevate past a very small degree. I think it was about 20 degrees because of the spinal fractures and the hip fractures. Um, so no, I had to learn a lot of stuff again and build all that you know, muscle up again to function normally because everything in a, in a stable position or mm. a position where it's not moving for that kind of time atrophies and yeah, you got to get it back. What was your state of mind at that point? So the only thing I really remember saying to myself was when I woke up in theatre, I was ventilated. Um, and my mom's a nursing sister. And I woke up to my mom and my sister in the isolation unit with me. And I couldn't talk. I was ventilated. But I needed to get an answer to two questions. So I'd say to myself, if the answer to either of these questions is yes, I'm not going to fight. The one was, am I going to lose a limb? And I somehow managed to get my questions across to my mom and sister. The answer to that question was, no, it doesn't look like it. My second question was, am I going to be brain damaged? And again, that answer was no. Um, my mom, to be honest, didn't answer it all that certainly, but it wasn't a yes. Mm. And from that point, I thought, okay, then... I'll manage this, I'll do what it takes, and I'll get through it. And it was a fighting spirit and a, a fighting state of mind from that moment forward. And how long from that point to the day that you left hospital? That's because I suppose recovery would have continued after yes, that, right? Yes, yeah. um, It was just under three and a half months okay. that I was initially in hospital in that isolation unit. And how, I suppose how, how much longer was it after that 
where you felt like you were almost back to normal, I suppose, when you were clo- as close to back to normal yeah. as you could get? So um, for the next four and a half years after being discharged, I needed various operations and extensive rehabilitation after each of those operations. Um, and yeah, it took, it took that amount of time to get me to what I am today. Mm. So it was, it was about 40 procedures later, close to 40 procedures later, yeah. um, and four and a half years, years after the initial hospitalization. Okay, so, so in that three-month period when you were in hospital, were you aware of what was going on in the media at that point? Um, not really. My sister stepped in. She can be quite a intense individual, and um, she handled everything. She There were media um, photographers and journalists trying to pretend to be family members and get into the isolation unit. Um, I was told all of this afterwards, but my sister had to take the reins in that regard and deal with, with the media entirely. Um, agree or disagree to any interviews, disagree to the family talking to them. And I wasn't really told about, I mean, there were far more serious things to worry about than mm. the media trying to. Yeah, exactly. So, um, no, I, I didn't realize that all of this was being publicized and going into whatever articles it was. Okay. Let's go back to the driver. So he, he was forced to pull over on the side. Did the cops arrest him on that day? Um, I think he was handcuffed and the Metro police arrived, uh, but I don't really know further than that. To this day? Yeah. Really? I don't know if anyone around knew what had happened. Lawrence was focused on me. He, he gave no attention to the taxi driver because he thought it was the end. Um, so no one that I knew was really watching what went on with the taxi driver. I remember Lauren saying to me he was handcuffed and the Metro police arrived and then dealt with him. But was he like, but does he like, I mean, you know, did arrested. he go to court and arrested and all yes, that thing? So okay. he was arrested. He was allowed out on bail from the beginning. Um, and we did appear in court various times. Um, you know, trials are often postponed and yeah. the stenographer wasn't working or. Um, they had fumigated the courts, reasons like that. We had a lot of postponements. Um, and in December of 2015, we were due back in court. Uh, the taxi driver was about to start giving evidence, and he failed to arrive. And since that day, there have been two court orders. Uh, yeah, two court, not court orders. What do you call it? Warrants of arrest. Warrants of arrest. Two yeah. warrants of arrest issued, and to date, um, nothing's been found. So you haven't really found justice, have you? No, no. Yo, that's. How does it make you feel? Like um, now, I mean, it's been well, how many years ago? Eight, is years. It? eight years now. So, um, okay. Well, since the accident is eight years, since he failed to appear is four years. Um, you know, from the start. When this accident happened, I immediately almost said to myself, there will be no benefit to me in being angry with the taxi driver or in feeling any negative emotion towards him. I felt that the best decision for me to make was to forgive him and not to question it and basically to disregard him entirely. And the reason I thought that was because if I was the one angry and bitter and resentful and um, you know upset by what he had done, all those emotions would only be mine to deal with and he would carry on none the wiser. So it never really mattered to me, as you know, blasé as that sounds, it it didn't really matter if justice wasn't done because I let go of anything towards him years before that. At what point was that exactly? I think while I was still in hospital for those initial three months. Fuck, how do you do that? Because I'd, I'd literally want to destroy the guy. I don't, I don't know. I don't know how, you know, like I said to you before we started recording, your mind can be your strongest asset or your 
biggest liability. And luckily for me, my mindset just went the way it went. Mm. Um, and part of my mindset was, was my attitude towards the taxi driver. I mean, a lot of other people were far more angry, far, far, far more angry than I've ever been. Um, the family received offers to take this guy out and to have him killed and all kinds of things because there was such an uproar about it. The public was funny enough, or ironically enough, more pissed off about it than you were. Yes. But I just believe it would have damaged me to, to be angry about it. How do you explain that, though? Not, not, not you know, the fact that you, you made the decision not to be angry mm. and carry that sort of guilt with you, I suppose. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like that whole thing. Um, but how do you explain the public's reaction to, to, to their, the veracity of the public reaction being, you know, multiples more acute than, than yours? How, how do you explain that? Because it's, it puts you in an, in a, in an interesting situation. Yeah. I use the word interesting loosely because I can't f- think of a better adjective. <laughs> 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 but it's like, um, you know, it's like this, you were the center of the story then you're in, you're incapacitated essentially. You don't have the exposure, and then the story becomes bigger than you, and you yes. were the epicenter of it. So yeah. it actually, you know what I mean? Like it's a weird because you're the one that should be pissed off, yeah, not the public. Like, yeah. Yes, sure, they must be angry and whatever, but do you understand? But like yes. they they chose to carry on with that yes. and yeah. make it their problem. Not yes. and you, as you said before we started recording, like there were Facebook groups of tens of thousands of yeah. people, you know. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and, and it became this movement for justice for, you know, fucking Kim McCasker, you know mm. what I'm saying? Um, and yet you, there you were as like, em, you know, embracing the inner game of Gandhi, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I think, I think my focus was just on myself. I needed all the energy I had to get through what I had to get through. I had to put it all into myself in a positive way and... I had a big mountain to climb. So I think a lot of, I mean, a lot of people have said to me that they are hugely inspired by my story and what happened and the way I handled it. But a big part of that is the forgiveness side of things. Um, Like I say, I can't, I can't really explain how that was my decision. I'm just lucky that my approach to it was what it was. Mm. Because if I'd gone the other way and been angry about it, I would have had those negative emotions festering inside me and probably carrying carrying on to burden me lifelong. Because at this rate, let's be honest, there isn't going to be justice done and the guy isn't even in the country anymore or maybe even alive. No one knows. Mm. So... Yeah, I was just really lucky that my mindset worked in my favor to be a point of strength. What would you want to say to to someone who was potentially, you know, member three of, you know, 40,000 on a Facebook group of Justice for, you know, Kim? Yeah. Um, and um, in their mind, they haven't reconciled the story um, with themselves. Uh, what, what would you like to say to that person? I would say... Um, if that's the way you handle it and that's how you're going to leave it, you are actually losing and allowing the enemy to win. And the reason I say that is because it's like that saying where they say, you drink the poison hoping the other person or the offender will die. Mm, yes, it's exactly yeah, like yeah. that. And my, my message or my advice to them would be, you're actually letting the enemy win. You're doing yourself no good and he's, or she, or whatever situation it is, maybe, or is carrying on a life with none of that that's going on in you. Mm. So you really are actually losing if you don't change your mindset. Yeah. Well, let's talk about your mindset. So, it, you know, obviously week one into it, so you've got a quite a like you know, four-year journey ahead of you, but you don't actually know how long no. it's going to take. No. So that's pretty overwhelming. So you can only ever take one day at a time. Yes. Um, and But every day it seems sometimes it's harder than the day before. Sometimes you have a better day, but oftentimes yeah. it's like, you know, two steps forward, three steps yeah, back. For sure. Um, what, where do you go inside in terms of your motivation to, to – 
Because, I mean, what can you do? Do you understand? It's almost like you must just lie there yeah. and, and be patient. And I'm the world's most impatient man. Okay. So, <laughs> so like, you know, I ride a Harley and I hope to God touch wood. Like, I don't ever have, like, a, a prang or anything, you know. Yeah. Um, but I can just imagine having to be patient yeah. and take one day at a time. Yeah. And that's a hard thing for a lot of people to do. Yeah. Where, where did you go internally to find... You know what I'm saying? Like that spark for yeah. that motivation to just keep fucking going at it because you know what? it's not. I, I don't even know that it was always there when I needed it to be. It was an extremely frustrating period in my life. Um, and I think sometimes I was at the point where I thought, oh, I can't do this any longer. And I didn't know where to draw that strength from. But I was forced to. Basically, my answer to you would be by force because there was nothing else I could do. I was mummified in a bed, couldn't move, couldn't feed myself, couldn't drink, couldn't go to the loo. So at times, yes, I would feel very, um, not hopeless about things, but very frustrated and at the point of enough is enough now. I don't know. I don't know where I'm going to find the next bit of energy to fight what's coming. And I think at times... Not a lot, but there were definitely times where I was just forced to accept, sit through, yeah, and to sit through through those emotions, try and deal with them, and essentially wait for them to go away because some reserves were built up, or you know, someone from outside came to visit and told me an uplifting story or whatever it may have been. Um, but yeah, there were definitely times where I just had to sit and wait. Mm. And what did you learn about acceptance and surrender in that bed? Mm. I learned I I did have to be very accepting of everything. I I I wasn't really even involved in conversations with the doctors. I mean my my parents handled everything and my family handled everything because my mom's a nursing sister. She signed the authorization for whatever procedures they were doing and she was involved very much with my care. Um, So I didn't have to negotiate, not negotiate, but I didn't have to sit with doctors and go, all right, these are the two options, which am I going to choose? What must I weigh up? I was kind of, all I had to do was lie in the bed and, and heal and not give up. Um, and I am quite an independent person and someone who likes to be in control and make choices and be the one deciding what's for Kim. Mm. Uh, this situation was the complete opposite. And I just had to kind of let go and say, these are people I trust and they've got my best interests at heart. So you're going to have to accept. It wasn't the easiest thing to do given my nature, But again, I didn't have a lot of choice in the matter. Mm. And did you find meaning in all of it? I mean, like, you know, it's quite hard when you're in it, it's quite hard to be thinking and reflecting back. And oftentimes, you know, you need to reflect on any experience in order to go, oh, yeah, that was the lesson or that Mm. was the meaning in it or Mm. this is how I've changed or this is the, you know, the perspective shift that I now have or a worldview that I now have. Um, So, look, I've, I've been asked a few times what do you think the reason was or, you know. The reason was if I could like, drive over you yeah, in a car. There wasn't to be much. very honest, I'm quite a logically yeah. brained thinker um, and not all, you know, ethereal and mm. introspective. And what did the spiritual. universe teach you while you were lying yes, in that bed? Exactly. So <laughs> people say, like, do you feel it was a second chance at life? My answer is like, no, no. Um, And they say, did it bring you closer to God? Did you feel like, uh, you know, you saw the light and he brought you back from it? And the honest truth is, no, I didn't have any of those kind of thoughts or experiences. Um, And I don't, to this day, know what the lesson I was or am still to learn from what happened. Mm. I really don't. That's the honest, maybe that... You know, you can you can get through anything that comes your way, but I mean that's also a very generalized thing to learn. I, you, mm. you almost know that instinctively. 
Um, so yeah, personally, I don't really know what it's taught me. I think the story has taught other people, a lot of other people, certain things. Um, just from conversations I've had and, you know, people reading the book and talking to the papers or reading the articles in the papers. A lot of people have said to me they've drawn inspiration from my story and it's helped them get through whatever they're dealing with. But I don't know what the message to me is mm. to this day. I'll, I'm sure I'll figure it out well, that along It could the way. be as simple as that, right? Yeah, could be. Yeah, well, I mean, if you think I'm looking at it objectively, having seen your your story on carte blanche, mm. I don't know when it was, mm. um, but um, but it could literally be as simple as that because yeah. it was far bigger than you. Yes. In the end. Yes. Yeah. You know, and that's by the way one of the reasons why you wrote the book, wasn't it? Yeah. So, um, like we said, the story grew a life of its own and became big in all the papers over the radio, um, Facebook groups were formed with 40,000 people and, yeah, it just went from zero to nothing very quickly and there was huge public interest in the story. Um, obviously, with that comes the media side of things who constantly asked for interviews and to do photo, shoot, photo shoots to publish medical details in their papers, newspapers, to do radio interviews, to do TV interviews. And for almost four and a half years, we declined. My family declined on my behalf for a long time. And then once I was out of hospital and able to talk and hold a phone, I would decline. The reason we did that is because there were court or legal matters that came out of this incident. And my father's an attorney. I was practicing as, as an advocate when this happened. And we both felt that something I said three years prior to the court case actually happening could come back to haunt me. Mm. You know, papers sensationalize and magazines change wording slightly to make readers want to read things. And um, we didn't want anything that had been said in a certain way to be misconstrued and come back in, in the court matter saying, well, you're now saying these are your disabilities or things that you are prevented from doing. But three years ago you said, oh, no, look how well are you doing so well mm. things are. So we declined all of that for about four and a half years until the third party matter with the road accident fund was settled. And then... I felt because the story had continued to gather momentum and the public interest hadn't really gone away, I felt a sense of duty in a way to go back to the public and all these supporters and say, here are the answers to your questions. Here, honest, black and white, no gray areas. This is the ugliness of it. This is the truth of it. And give the whole story to them in my own words because they had supported me for so long so I wanted to to go back and say okay there we go there are your answers question a lot of the times whatever happened to that girl who was dragged by a taxi and I needed to give that back to the public because of how supportive they were and what was the reaction to you know having those answers finally published to black and white just people mainly telling me how inspirational what I had overcome was and how inspirational I was to them. Do you see yourself as being inspirational? No, I never did really. Um, I didn't write the book to inspire people. I, I didn't have the point of view that my story is so inspiring and this will be an inspirational thing. Um, but I'm really glad that that's what was taken from the story. What did they find inspirational about it though? Was it the fact that you recovered this thing, that you didn't die? That you I know, think what, what, was, what was the general? I think it was the forgiveness towards the taxi driver. Um, and I don't know, I suppose the fighting spirit. You know, it's, it's sometimes difficult for me to answer these questions because I almost minimize things. So 
the battle or the road I had to walk and the mountain I had to climb was big, but I never let it become too big. I never saw things in the worst way possible because that would make them harder to overcome. So those kind of questions, you know, how do I see it? Uh, like, I don't want to say it, it wasn't that big of a deal. Like, yeah, I had to lie in hospital for three months, but it was okay. Um, there was definitely effort and fight and a lot of emotion um, put into getting me to, to where I am. Um, but, yeah, I don't, I don't know that my view of the story and what happened to me aligns with the general public's or even my family's or friends. Mm. I think I've, I view it quite differently in a way. That's so yeah. interesting. That's so interesting, yeah? yeah? It's like a real dichotomy for me. I'm trying to wrap mm. my head around that and how, how I would feel about yeah. that. Even so many years later, mm. to still not be reconciled and to, like I would still have so many questions and, and you no, know. No, I don't. See, again, I don't see the point. Mm. No one's going to answer them for me. So I'm wasting my time asking them. I'm wasting my time trying to work out why me and what could I have done differently and should I have missed Jim that day and should I... All those questions, all those different situations or scenarios, I never even entertained because I didn't see the point. Mm. It wasn't going to get me anyway. But the public was pretty instrumental, though, in, in providing this overwhelming groundswell of support oh, yes. to you yes, and absolutely. to your family yes. and throughout, you know, the, the years that yes. ran on and, you know, the trial, people would have been following that and, yeah. you know, offering help and services and hitmen knocking on your door. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty cool. You know what I mean? Yeah. I could use a couple. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, but um, but uh, the support system that you that you had, I suppose, is, was, was huge for you at oh, the time. Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, I wouldn't have gotten through what I did without the support of my family and family friends. Like I say, my mom was very instrumental in my care in the hospital, whether it meant she needed to fight with the doctor or suggest what should be done. She didn't actually care. She, her attitude was, this is my child. It's her life um, that we're fighting for. And so I'm going to recommend or insist on whatever I feel is right. Um, so that support was was instrumental in my recovery um you know at one point they wanted to do a tracheotomy for example because I was ventilated and I wasn't starting to breathe on my own enough so that I could be de-ventilated and the surgeon was almost at the point where he said I'll be doing a tracheotomy and my mom fought with fought him on it and said no you will not we're going to give her some more time she'll breathe she'll get there and, you know, if it wasn't for my mom, I would have had a hole in my throat today. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, she that support was huge in my recovery. But the support of my immediate family and family, friends, and general public got me through a lot as well. Um, I always had a very <coughs> strong support structure around me. I never sat alone or lay alone half conscious in that room by myself I always had a visitor with me people were I mean immediate family initially in the isolation unit but every day my father mother sister brother would be there mm. and they were still carrying on with work and university and whatever their general lives consisted of but um, their support was phenomenal and the public support as well. I mean, when you hear all these things and people have the certain view of you, it is it is a bit difficult to be like, oh, no, I'm, I'm going to give up on that one. I'm just going to throw in the towel over here. You almost have people like egging you on and, and shouting for you. So you you propelled to get to that better point. Yeah, take that next step. Mm, yeah. 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 Um, Nicole, your cousin. Yes. So weird story. <laughs> so weird story. This whole story is weird, but anyway, uh, <laughs> it gets weirder. So I was like, yeah, no, so who can we phone on the show? And uh, so she's like, well, you could phone my cousin Nicole. So I'm like, cool, give me a number. 
And then I plug the number in and then I phone. I'm like, you know, when you get caller ID, it says it brings up a number if the number's on your phone. And it's Nicole and I used to actually work with your cousin yeah. in another lifetime. Yeah. And um, I think let's phone her. I'm going to try phone her on my phone. But what, but what I want to get from her is what she thinks is the, the lesson of it all. Okay. How's that sound? Yeah. Sounds okay, good. Cool. I'd but love to know. On a scale I'd of, love to know you really want to know that. It's okay. You see, that's why people come on the Matt Brown show. It's because they get answers to questions that they've had for decades. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Let's try this. It's ringing. Hi, this is Nicole. I'm not able to keep a call off now. Nicole, that's a fail. You must send her that clip afterwards. She'll it be often gutted. does that. Lots of times when I try to phone her, it um, rings once. And oh, really? Should we try her WhatsApp them. line? Okay. Let's do that. Yeah. So, oh, here we go. She's phoning. Oh, amazing. Oh. Just put her on speaker there. There you go. Hi. Hi, Nicole. Hi, Nikki. It's uh, Matt Brown. How are you? Glue, yeah, she remembers. First impressions last, you know. <laughs> okay, no, that's fine. Just tell him he's live on the Matt Brown show. <laughs> he's two. <laughs> he's world famous. So, um, Nicole, you speak for me because you've got the phone there and the mic. So, you ask her. Ask her what. Okay, so, Nikki, we've been chatting about the accident and everything that went on. And the question Matt wanted to ask you was, what do you think the lesson out of everything that happened was? For you? Yes. For me. Um, to date, like the lesson to date, um, probably, geez, I think you handled it so well, so it's difficult to say the lesson, but... Um, Oh, probably that you needed you needed a lot of help. So you probably a lot like that's a lesson to learn to like let people help you, accept that you can't do everything on your own, um, and was needing people more than you realize because you've always had that kind of attitude and stance that you know you can do it on your own. And I think the accident kind of allowed you to actually like put your defenses down and ask for help. I think probably that would be the one thing I can say. Yeah, I actually said something similar earlier that I like to be in control, but this was something I just had to hand over the reins for. So, yeah. You to be reliant on, like, hugely reliant on people. And then also, like, I mean, you, you're not very um, open emotionally to people. And I think you needed to also, that began to also unfold itself after many years after the accident only. Mm, yeah. That... You know, things do have an effect on people, and even though they come across as resilient and strong to the outside world, things are going on internally. So you need family and you need people. Yeah, yeah, that's deep. Nicole, do you want to come on the show? I think you have lots <laughs> yeah, to say. Well, Bring your TV. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> Bring your two-year-old. You can meet mine. Oh, he's gorgeous. You'll want him to be an advert. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Nicole. Thanks, okay, Dickie. You got what you needed. Uh, let me know when you want me on the show. Yeah, done, <laughs> done. Bye. Set it up, you dog. Set Thank it up. You. Wow, that's amazing. Eh? Yeah. Let's fucking wish we enter crowd this year. <laughs> <laughs> Go, Nicole, Nicole. Nicole. That, no, but that was pretty deep, eh? Yeah. Yeah. Nicole was also very involved in my... We've always been very close, her and I, um, but with the accident and supporting me and being there for me in all ways. Uh, yeah, she, she also had a big role to play. You know, I said on the last show that I believe that life's always happening for you, not to you. And it's only your, per your perception of the experience that you're having that makes the difference. Yes. And, um, and, w and it's interesting because when, when I initially asked you, I said, what's the lesson you were like, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't know what this thing's all about. And then, and then what I always say is it's you need to speak to someone that you trust, right, or mm -hmm. that you love or whatever, mm -hmm. someone in your peer group, a mentor or whatever, just like Nicole, mm -hmm. right, as an example there. And what they do is they play a role where they, where they hold a mirror up to you. Right. 
and they see things that you can't see. Mm. So she said, well, you know, you, you'd never really ask for help. You mm. were very independent. You actually said that in the beginning, mm. right? Very independent, yeah. you know, I decide what I Wanna do for me. Want to be in control, yeah. And, and then the accident happened, and then that for her and for Nicole, that was the, that was the lesson, yeah. right? was that you needed to learn yeah. to ask for help, yeah. that you couldn't do it all on your own. Yeah. And um, and that you needed and and that you needed the love and support of not only your family but fucking hell, like a good portion of the South African public. Yeah, do you understand yeah. to show you the power of support yes. and help. Yeah, and, and like Absolutely. now now if I asked you what was the lesson, yeah, it, uh, you would go. I think that that's probably yeah. spot on. Part of it, yeah. Weird, eh? Yeah. Well, then it was a very good idea to phone Nicole. We're going to phone everyone <laughs> on the show from now on. We'll just keep phoning until someone gives us a great answer. <laughs> wow. So, I mean, but that, but, but, you know, but it's such a small thing. I, I, I do this thing. I write about this book in, uh, I write about this book. I write about this process in my book. Um, number one on Amazon, check it out. Uh, you're okay. in a game. Uh, but, um, <laughs> Preach, cute dog, but um, but I believe in this idea of triangulation. So if you're stuck, like your hypothesis was, I don't know, okay. right? Yeah. So whatever that is, if should I quit my business? Should I leave this my husband or whatever the case is? Mm-hmm. If you if you're thinking something but you're not sure, and remember, mm-hmm. your version of the experience is not the truth. Mm-hmm. It never is because you delete your mind is deleting and generalizing and distorting the yeah. experience, and so you only remember. Remember, you said in the beginning, you said, well, I didn't remember yes. them lifting that. You don't remember the full story. Yeah. So you can't be the holder of the true yeah. uh, experience or the truth objectively. Yes. You can't be. So if you're trying to find the truth about something, you do this thing called triangulation. Okay. So what is it? So basically, you reach out to three people that you trust. So okay. like Nicole would be one, your dad, your mom, whatever. Okay. And, in, and for our listeners out there, you would pick three people that you trust. They don't need to be family. They don't necessarily need to be friends, but they need to be opinions that you know you can trust. Value. And that you value, exactly. Or that you hold in high regard or mm. that perhaps have you know an experience that's different to you. Even though you might not like them, yes. you know that they're, the, what they will say to you will be a version of, a, of the truth. So what right. you do is you say, listen, um, you know, if it is my mentor, or my friend, whatever, Nicole, um, I'm thinking this. I don't know what the lesson was. What do you think? And then Nicole will say what she said, and you, yeah. know, you needed to learn to ask for help. But then you phone a second person, a third person, and you test that. Yeah. So I'm, th- you know, I was told this. What do you think? Or maybe you don't even lead. You just still tell yeah. them. I'm, I don't know. What do you think? Yeah. And then see what they say. Mm-hmm. And invariably, what you're looking for is is essentially odds. Yeah. Right. So if you get two out of the three people saying that you should quit your business, or that you should, this is, you know, you needed to learn to ask for help, or you, whatever it was. Yes then you know that that's yeah. a pretty good thing to bank on. Right. So that's how you test your own version. And, and okay. why you do that is because you're trying to make better decisions yeah. or you're trying to reconcile certain things that have happened to you so yes. that you can take things forward in your yeah. life in a way that you're self-aware yeah. and that you're not bound or constrained by their old paradigm of things yeah. you know what i mean like yeah. this happened to me and therefore this defines me no, yeah. or this business failed and therefore that defines me yeah. or i was hit by this taxi and therefore this defines yeah. me you know what i'm saying yeah. so whatever that is in, in like oh god there's so many like permeations and nuances mm. in that whole story mm. but but i find that to be hugely powerful okay yeah, you should try it. I I'd, will. I'd actually be interested to to hear from you. To hear the feedback. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just even I'll follow up and tell me what you think. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Be very I'll interesting. Try that. Yeah. So you said um, that you don't see yourself as inspiring. I think your story is inspirational. Um, it's it's not a story like well, I'm the man who you know did the most pull ups ever in 24 hour <laughs> period. <laughs> yeah. But but so what? That doesn't you yes. know you find inspiration in different things. Yes. Um, what would you like to be remembered for? I think probably my my positive outlook on whatever I can have an outlook on. Um, yeah, I think I'm a true optimist. I look for the best outcome or the best version or the best um, the best I can't think of the word I need. Outcome? Not outcome. Scenario. The, the best scenario, you know, 
in every situation. Um, yeah, and I try and I try and live life like that. Um, and if ever ask for advice or having a f- conversation with friends or family or whatever, and my opinions asked, I try and give them the most positive outlook and view on how to view things. Mm. So I think, yeah, for me, it would be my positivity and always trying to make, even if it's a bad situation, trying to make the most of... Of what you have. Yeah. 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 Trying to see there's a black side and a white side. You always try and see that, that glimpse of the white and you try and disregard the dark. What do you think of this whole I'm staying movement? So I am a big fan of our country and have never really entertained the thought of leaving. Um, I've never wanted to leave. I still don't want to leave. I don't want anyone else to leave. Um, But yeah, unfortunately that's happening a lot. Uh, I hope more people get on board with the I'm staying movement. I think our country and, and what it has to offer, if not for the problems that we have, which every country has a version of themselves, um, I think people would be flocking to South Africa with the weather we have and the the lifestyle we have and, and, and. So I, I wish people would get more on board with it and, and not feel, okay, pull up the ladder, Jack, I'm fine because I'm out of here. But have the outlook more that, we all in this together. Doesn't matter race, age, color, whatever. We all in this together, South Africans. If there's poverty, everyone gets affected. If there's poverty, there's more theft. If you're not the one committing the theft, you're the one being stolen from. So we all, you know, like intertwined in what goes on and what happens in this country. And I think the attitude is a little bit too often, well, I'm good. I'm out of here. I've got a backup plan. So, mm. yeah, you know, it's, it, uh, it, it, it's, it's not a sense of I want to get involved and things could be better or things could change, but let's get on board with what mm. needs to happen. This, um, your story is the kind of thing that when you turn on the radio at 7 o'clock in the morning yeah, um, and you hear about a young white woman who, you know, you can just fucking imagine, right? It's just so cliche. Yeah. It's mm. like, oh my God, it's mm. in the social fabric of this country, yeah. you know, where uh, this poor child gets hammered by, you know, uh, an obscene, you know, uh, taxi driver. And, yeah. and, and, you know, it's it's just that stuff. It's this yeah. this continual, you know, and I would go, oh, taxi drivers are the worst, you yeah. know, da, 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 and this is why I want to leave this country. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, it, and and, and would it, your story would have contributed to that yes, sentiment. Yes, so it did. Um, a lot of people immediately jumped on that train. It's a racism thing. It's a racial thing. She was white, so he went for her. We put that to bed very quickly because two and a half months before my accident with the taxi, he knocked over a little 10-year-old black boy with his taxi. How do you know that? My father came across it in running the legal matters and representing me, somehow came across this story or someone told him about it. I don't know the details about this little boy that had been involved in an incident with the same taxi driver. Yeah. He didn't drag him, but he knocked into him with his taxi, as far as I know. And this child has permanent brain damage and lifelong complications due to the injuries he sustained. And my dad contacted the family and said, look, I'm not going to bring a criminal matter or try and get justice um, for you with this guy, but what I will do is represent you in a third-party claim and at least get you some money for, Mm. you know, the comfort of your life going forward because of the disabilities you now have. So we didn't ever delve into that racial discussion because – the answer was straight away, well, two months before, he did it to a little black boy. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, I, it was maybe lucky in a way that that, that, that had happened. That sounds terrible. Oh, yeah. But that also allowed people of all colors to support and to form like a community of whatever happened to Kim McCusker. Black, white, Indian, 
yellow, green, whatever, um, because there wasn't that racial divide. Yeah, you could have been the choice to. Chose to pile there. Chose to uh, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> you could have been a toaster child. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. Yeah. But a poster child, okay, um, uh, for like racial divide. Yeah, actually. Yeah, and that would have been a far worse situation because I suppose you guys did really well in the sense that you didn't comment. Yes, because that would have been a no no. Yes. Um, and thank God you had legal fortitude and, yeah. and experience, then you knew straight off from the outset not to comment. Mm. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Because, why, as you say, one thing totally could have ta- been taken out of context. Mm. The media twist your word, like, yeah. where it's like, I did a, uh, just to give you an example of that in my own very non cool world, but I did this, like, <laughs> I did this show uh, called The Sales and Persuasion Masterclass, very, very popular, sold out event, blah, blah. And okay. uh, sorry, no, it wasn't that one, it was a Bitcoin event okay. called uh, Crypto Kung Fu, whatever. Mm-hmm. And the meet my PR company invited the media to come and write, okay. right? But now, when they write, to your point, they don't write necessarily for the truth, mm. they write for the clicks and the baits mm-hmm. and the headlines and stuff. Yeah. So um, we wrote, we spoke about different kinds of cryptos and all this kind of stuff and blockchain and property and this is, and anyway you know what the headline was what they can take your land but they can't take your Bitcoin oh my golly yeah I shit you not see see you can't control <sighs> that but you know and we were like or rather and then it was like the Matt Brown show it I'm like hang on yeah and it tries to people try and like push it into a little box where it's something it's not yes and. It's difficult when it's a racial thing because, look, I do, I do think to a degree, and this is probably so controversial, but to a degree, and given the history of this country and everything, white people are berated more, crucified more for doing something that is racist towards, say, a black person than a black person is to doing something towards a white person. Q, do you agree racist. with that? Do you? 100%. Really? And by the way, Q is black. Q is black. <laughs> <laughs> we never get called... Yeah, it, and, and maybe it's trying to put things into balance after they've been unbalanced for so long, so it's overcompensation, I don't know. Um, but... Yeah, you've got to be so careful today. And like you say, with that article, then it becomes, oh, the Matt Brown show, are they trying to insinuate that there's a level of racism involved in your show? Mm. What is the... And as a white person, you've got to be that much more careful mm-hmm. because mm. you you are far more of the bad guy as a white racist than you are as a black racist, mm. if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah, it does. But, you know, but the thing for me in this media st- particular angle to this whole story is that you can't control it then no no you, you know can't. what i mean like they can fill their inches on their newspapers and mm. put words up on on their websites and stuff to like drive their ad funded business models and what have you um but like you can't get them to take that shit down no you know and the thing also in the personal context within the media space i've you know i've got a pretty pretty well formed media brand personality and that okay. kind of thing um and you know, if someone writes some trash talk about your business, that's one thing. But when they trash talk you and they say things about you personally, like I've taken shit in social media for posts that she wrote. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I'm like, fuck, I didn't even write the damn yeah. thing and you're crucifying me. Yeah. Fuck off. Yeah. You know what I mean? Thank you, Q. Not you. you know. <laughs> Q's my, my my girl. But um, but but it's but the thing is, they 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 attach it to you. Yes. And now, what are you supposed to do? Yeah. So and it's it, very hard to get rid of. You know, totally. Once those perceptions are formed. Exactly, and you, it would have been no fault of your own. It would mm. have been our. Oh, it wouldn't be Kim McCasker, the girl who you know got uh, dragged underneath the taxi, driven yeah. by a black taxi driver. Yeah. But it would have been. Kim McCasker, the white, blah, yeah. blah, and, and, and. Yeah. You know what I mean? And now what you're going to do? 100%. How do you change that perception? Because then you're crucified. No, a lot of difficulty. That's the thing. You, you crucified, you judge, jury, and executioner in public opinion. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. And so how do you control that? No, it's difficult. You know, my brother, um, just now, he had, uh, I've never actually heard of anyone have such bad luck 
as what he's had in these last five months. But the last thing that happened when I referred to all these bad luck incidents, incidences is that on Sunday night or Monday night, um, he, his girlfriend and a friend were driving back from Kruger and they were pulled over in Dalmas by four guys dressed in police uniform in a marked police car and um, they were quickly told, this is a hijacking, um, if you don't cooperate, we will shoot. And they kept, they drove them into the bush and they spent hours tied up, my brother, girlfriend and his friend, I was tied up with, with, while these four guys went through the vehicle um, trying to find the tracker and steal whatever they could have valued, the laptops, the phones, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But Ian, my brother, said to me that while they were sitting or lying on the grass cable tied, um, there was some conversation between him and these, these four guys, and he said they were actually very nice to them and very civil about things. Uh, but at one point, they started speaking about racism and were quite ugly about what the whites have done to the blacks. Um, and I don't know what was said. I mean, I think he's too traumatized to remember and uh, tell us what that was. But he did say they raised racism and they were, they were very angry about it and racist towards whites. Mm. So, but you can understand that. Yeah. I can. Yeah. You know, I mean, but again, you have to be so careful. So um, what's uh, Danny Kay was on this show. So, you know, Danny Kay, the yes. pop star. So he, or the Prince of Pop. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that was his. Oh, no, that's totally his know. thing. Okay. So he, he was on the show um, not too long ago. And then it wasn't a, like it was probably four, maybe five months later, maybe a bit longer. But um, he went out on social media and he was like, well, I remember that whole thing. He was speaking about white privilege. Right. He said whites are privileged in South Africa. Mm -hmm. And uh, the social media backlash that he got on that was just like. Ooh, I don't even know why I touched that. Like, but I I mean, there's just certain things you don't, yes. you shouldn't talk about as Danny Gay. But also, especially, but going he, back to my point, especially yeah. as a white person in South Africa, yeah. at least for the moment. Yeah. But, but again, he would actually argue otherwise mm -hmm. yeah. so i actually find him to be amazing to speak to because he's like and remember he like he was on stage singing with like yeah you know, with black with artists, black artists. And, he was yeah. like you know johnny clegg type mm. you know uh, musician or entertainer so he's got a very unique perspective mm. you understand mm. um but but whatever it is he at least stood up for it yes and he said this is how i feel yeah and whether you choose to agree with me or not don't give a shit. Yeah. yeah. And I find that to be uh, quite a hard thing for a lot of people to do in today's yes. world because yeah. they don't want to stand for something. Mm. They don't want to say no. Agreed. You know what I mean? Mm. Um, mm. And, and yeah, and, and, but he did. But yeah. he, I don't know, because now, which is, I don't know whether it was great PR strategy yes. <laughs> because what he does was, forget his, um, his partner is black, right? And they do all these keynotes about diversity. Okay. And it happened at the same time. Yeah, that there was all this controversy. Yeah, he, yeah. He's a smart mofo, you know what I'm yeah. saying? So you, you can't bank on the fact that he was just doing that by mistake, you know no, what I'm saying? No, no, no. It was quite a thing to yeah, say. Yeah, get something to trend and then you. Yeah, and then, by the way, now I'm doing this thing. Yeah. Here's my album. And exactly. So. Yeah. Yeah, my book. My yeah. book. You get my the, book. Yeah. The train going <laughs> and you let it steamroll. So, yeah. Uh, all right, cool. Uh, Kim, let's wrap this up. Okay. Um, so what's next for you, do you feel? I mean... Okay, so um, I did say earlier when the accident happened, I was qualified and practicing as an advocate. I haven't yet been able to go back to the bar since the accident. So in the last eight years, um, like I said, it took a long time for me to recover to this point. And for four and a half years, I was in and out of hospital having procedures done. And when those were done and the immediate necessary procedures were finished, I still wasn't in a position to go back to law physically um, and also mentally with a lot of the medication I, I needed to be on, concentration was affected, affected, 
affected. Energy levels were affected, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I ended up opening a business. Um, it's called Lady Grace Nail and Skin Center. So it's a beauty business in Northcliffe. And I have run that for the last three and a half years. Um, I do feel I'm at the right place now to challenge myself with something else. Um, whether that means going back to the bar as an advocate at some level or starting another business, I can't say, but I'm starting to explore the options available to me because um, I'm not stimulated enough, I don't feel. Mm. Now my mind's back to where it once was, you know? So, um, yeah, I'm at that point where... I might start practicing law again or at least consider it. Um, and if sure. that doesn't work, then I'll consider other things. We'll see. So why do you do what you do now? I mean, like what actually gets you out of bed in the morning today? Um, I think the business is a reflection on me. And because I want a certain impression to be given to customers and clients and people in general – making sure I'm there to achieve that high standard as a reflection of me is what gets me out of bed in the morning. Mm. So in a way, um, people's, people's viewpoints on me, I'm, I'm not really someone who cares a whole lot about what other people think. I don't mean it like that. But, you know, maybe it comes from a place of I was held in such high regard by the public and seem to be so inspirational and, 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 and it's not a, it's not a bad way to be seen. It's, you know, it's, it's encouraging. It's, mm. it's a nice way to be seen. Um, and yeah, I don't want that to get lost. So I've got to put myself forward in my business and make sure it's of a high standard because it's associated to me. And yeah, I think for now, that's what gets me, gets me going. Well, Kim, thanks for uh, sharing your story. Um, it's been uh, great to to have you on the show. Covered a lot of ground. Yes. Uh, also reconnected with Nicole, so yes. made a, a reacquainted a new friend. <laughs> um, and uh, Q, do we have any crowd effects on this uh, sound desk here? Because no. I wanted to go out with a bang, with rent crowd. We don't have anything. <laughs> what do you have here? What's this? The voice of reason. Yeah, that's <laughs> definitely not it. We've got some crickets. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, Kim, thanks for being on the show. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me.